light. It's how we see the world, and without it, everything would be dark. Unless you didn't have eyes, in which case you don't even see darkness, you just see nothing. Which is somehow way more terrifying, and I'm not brave enough to test it myself because I quite like my vision. Anyways, light works a little sillily in video games. Wait, is that even a real word? Huh, it's. Most video games don't simulate real light. Instead, they use a technique called rasterization, which is basically like giving a kindergarten a coloring book and asking them to draw your scene, but like insanely well and fast. But today, we're going to be looking at a more realistic approach to lighting. I'm using OpenGL because modern engines like Unity do too much behind the scenes, which ruins all the fun. No, it doesn't. Would have been so much easier using Unity. And please don't yell at me in the comments. I realized after finishing the whole project that OpenGL isn't ideal for ray tracing. Vulkan or DXR would have been smarter, but here we are now. The first step is to understand exactly how ray tracing works. Ray tracing is a technique using graphics programming to try and simulate how light works in the real world. Let's take this scene for an example. Here's the light source and the camera and some obstacles. In reality, rays are shut out from the light source, bouncing off the objects until it eventually reaches the camera or dissipates out in space. The problem is that the vast majority miss the camera completely. And since the simulation that we're in doesn't seem to have any computational limit, this seems like a viable approach. But this would turn my GPU into a light source. So how can we make it so each and every ray has a meaningful impact on the final render, like how each and every one of you have a meaningful impact when you hit the like and subscribe button? What if we shot the rays from the camera instead? Drawing out this approach, we can already see how many more rays hit the light source. After doing some research, this is what every other ray tracer does, so I think I'll stick with this method too. Now, let's see if we can actually get this to work. Since we're eventually going to be sending out millions of rays, I need a way to talk to the GPU. Because doing this on my CPU, I think would level a small city. So I've made a compute shader with some code that'll run for every pixel. Now if we get the pixel location, set its color, and run the program, the whole screen is cyan. But this isn't very interesting. They had more impressive programs in the 70s. Let's pass in the camera matrix for the rotation and position into the shader. To see if this works properly, I've written some code that will set the color of the pixel to the direction that the ray is shooting from the camera. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Each direction is its own unique color. Now that we know that that works, let's try to get a model in here and see if we can get the compute shader to draw it. To start, I've written quite a bit of code to load the model data into the GPU. Then back in the compute shader, I've created this line cast function that's responsible for giving us data on what the ray has hit. The function loops over each triangle, testing if the ray has intersected with it. It'll update the hit information and return true. If it loops through all the triangles and never hits anything, the function will return false. Then back in the main function, we'll test if this function returns true. And if it does, for testing purposes, we'll just draw a white pixel to the screen. Oh, it's a little hard to see because of the back wall. There we go. All right, I've updated the code so it reads in the base color of the model. Running the code again, looks pretty good. Wait, that doesn't look correct. After looking around a bit, it was because I was returning the first triangle that the rays hit. And since the triangles aren't in any order, this causes a little bit of a depth problem. To fix this, we instead need to keep track of the closest triangle. Then when looping through and hitting a triangle, we will check if it's closer than the last. If it is, we will update the information to the new closest triangle. There we go. This now looks correct, but definitely doesn't look good. We're running at a fraction of the frames compared to the rasterized version without any lighting. Right now, the code is just simply hitting an object and returning the color. Instead, the ray should bounce and accumulate the color of each object it hits, each time making the ray's impact weaker because no surface reflects 100% of the incoming light. The implementation of this is actually pretty simple. Going back to the code we were just looking at, we only need to add a few lines. Firstly, we need to loop over the number of max bounces we will allow. Then going down a few lines, I've added this line to decrease the strength of the light depending on the color's surface. Right below this is a potential early stop. If the ray strength or output of the next bounce will be too low, in this case below 0.1, then there's no need to keep going, as there won't be any noticeable change. Next is the barycentric function. In 3D models, normal data is stored inside the vertices. 
but we need to find the normal vector somewhere on the object that might not exactly be the vertex location. So the barycentric function will return a vec3 telling us how much each vertex has a say in the final output of our normal. Finally, we update the ray location and direction for the next bounce. Now let's run the program and see if it worked. There we go, we got reflections. This would look great if we loaded in a mirror dimension. Instead, we need to slightly roughen up the rays. But before we get into roughness, let me tell you about a really random story, but I promise it'll make sense. Throughout the time I was working on this project, there was a day that I went to my grandma's house for Thanksgiving. And towards the end of the visit, when everyone was leaving, we had a little bit of downtime, so we put on TV. It was a comedy show. On the comedy show, it was a stage that the comedian was standing on. And I noticed something weird. It was a black stage, but it was very reflective. Which is weird because I thought black materials didn't reflect any light. After reflecting on this, uh, see what I did there? I realized that some objects actually have a reflective coating. Taking a look back at the code, we're currently multiplying the ray's strength times the base color, which causes darker surfaces to be less reflective. Like in reality, objects can have a clear coat finish. On a closer look, it looks something like this, where there's a smooth coating on the surface that is slightly transparent, meaning that some light bounces off the coating while other rays pass through and bounce off the object like we had before. For this, we need to add another parameter to our material data. This will be responsible for what percentage of light bounces off the clear coat. Then in the compute shader, we need to see if the ray is bouncing off the clear coat. If it doesn't, then we'll set the strength like normal. Otherwise, don't touch the strength at all. Now running the program again, here's the before and the after. You can see how much brighter or more glossy the reflections look, especially around darker areas like the black tiles. Let's take a closer look at exactly what happens when a ray of light hits a surface. Right now, we're assuming that the object's surface is completely smooth, allowing the light to bounce off with the same angle it came in with but any real surface has tiny imperfections. This causes the light to bounce off in seemingly random directions. Let's start by making a random function since GLSL doesn't already have one built in. I could just try making a function with an input of the pixel location, then add a sign function, multiply it by some arbitrary values, and finally, let's throw in a fract function to make sure the value is between zero and one. Let's try this. There's some randomness, but there's also a lot of repeating patterns, which isn't desired. What if we just try changing the input to the random function? Instead, I'll pass in a vec3 of the pixel with another arbitrary value for the z multiplied by the ray's direction. This already looks much better. There's still some problematic areas, but I'll worry about that in a minute. Next is to convert the random float into a random direction. My initial idea is to generate two more values with other random inputs that I can think of. All right, we have color, but now we're back to a pretty obvious repeating texture. The next thing I wanna try is to use the seed value that gets updated each time I call the random function. Here, I've created a function to initialize the seed value by using the pixel location. Then back in the random function, I take in the seed, update it by multiplying by more arbitrary values, and finally return it divided by the maximum value of an unsigned int so we can get back a number between zero and one. I'm pretty happy with this. Now that we have a random direction, we can use this when updating our ray's direction. This will give us an even distribution around the ray's hit point, but we want reflections. So any ray that goes into the object needs to be flipped. You could do this by testing the dot product of the new direction versus the hit normal. If the dot product is negative, meaning the ray is going against the hit normal, we need to flip the vector by multiplying by negative one. And let's see the results. A little noisy, but pretty good. You can really see the red, green, and blue light reflecting off the walls onto Suzanne. And how about the dice scene? This is looking pretty good too. You can see a little bit of green reflecting off this die and a little bit of red reflecting off this one. It's also cool to zoom in and see that around half the pixels are black and the other half are just basic colors. Up close, it doesn't look that great, but zooming back out, it looks kind of good, but there's a slight problem currently. This result is so random that the incoming ray direction doesn't have any effect on the output, which is a little more apparent when we make the material reflective again. Nothing changed. 
We can accomplish this by simply lerping the random and reflective directions between each other, with the alpha value being how rough we want the surface. So I've set up this scene with a few models, each with a higher roughness value than the last. If you squint your eyes hard enough, you might be able to see that as the roughness value gets higher, the blurrier the reflection gets. Now let's address the elephant in the scene. Why is it so noisy? The problem here is that we're only sending out one ray per pixel. This can cause random rays to travel on very different paths, although their start direction was very similar. My idea was to send out multiple rays, each with a slightly random direction. Here, I have slightly edited this snippet of code. To start, I am now calculating how strong each ray should be using the samples per pixel variable that I have passed in from the CPU. Then loop for each sample, starting with getting our seed for the random number. For the UVs, they're pretty much the same as before, but now with a slight random offset. Then continue the code like before, but now doing the bounce loop for each and every sample. And for the color, all we have to do is add it for each iteration. This leaves us with a much better result. But as we get to higher samples, my whole computer starts to lag. Which I guess would be fun if you don't want to touch your computer while rendering. But hey guys, I like to watch YouTube to to while I eat. Video. So a better approach is to drop the samples and let the progress accumulate over multiple frames. For this, all we need to pass in is the number of frames that have been rendered since the start of the application. Then instead of directly updating the color to the output image, we add it using this equation, which looks something like this. All right, we gotta clear the output when the camera moves. Here we go, much better. And right, I can guys, actually use my computer again. And let's try just letting it sit here for a little and see how good we can get it. Okay, it's been sitting here for around 30 minutes now, and I could definitely say it's looking better than one sample, but it's still pretty noisy. And in future videos, I would like to experiment with ways to decrease the noise completely. The final thing I want to take a look at is a depth of field effect, something that makes the ray tracer feel a lot more realistic, because real cameras and even our eyes can't keep everything in perfect focus. It also just makes everything look so much better. I've set up a better scene with a little bit more depth for this. To start, let's just try to blur the image to get a good understanding of how this effect works. This is pretty simple, as we're already almost there. We're currently shooting on multiple rays per pixel to make the scene look smoother. But what if we let the rays originate from a slightly larger area instead of being contained to its own pixel? Let's see how that looks. Yeah, I'd say that's pretty blurry. But now, instead of converging the points of the camera, we need to converge the points at the location we want to be focused. And the points from the camera are the ones that are randomly offset. Let's try to implement this. Here, I'm getting a random point on the X and Y, then projecting it to the camera view. Then we find the location the ray would have been at the focus point, using its old direction. Then doing some simple math, we find the new direction on where the ray should converge. Running the code again, there's a few problems. Where am I? Okay, I brought it back to blurry. And the movement's messed up. All right, fix that. Huh, I don't even know what happened here. All right, a little zoomed in. And I have eyes in the back of my head. All right, everyone prepare for hyperdrive. Whee! There we go, I think I finally figured it out. Let's go back to the other scene. I also set the depth of field and focus distance to my mouse position. So if I move my mouse left and right, it changes the blurriness, and moving it up and down changes the focus distance. Now let's see if we can get a nice output. There we go, I'm pretty happy with that. So I think this concludes the video. Even after all this, I feel like I've only scratched the surface of what a ray tracer can actually do. There's still so many more things I wanna explore. I've had a lot of fun making this video. Watching each feature slowly come together, seeing the image get just a little bit more realistic each time. Okay, maybe not every time. Whee! And if you enjoyed this video and want to see more like it, leave a comment on what you would want to see next. Alright, that's it. Thanks for watching. Okay, bye bye now.